For those of you online and those of you here in the auditorium, welcome. We're very happy to have our January 6th meeting of the uh, uh, History Association. And with all of our meetings, we start with the welcome from our president, Pam Price, direct from Norway. And so Pam, please okay. give a welcome. Okay, very happy to welcome you in the new year. Education in Mexico is a complicated issue. While the country produces fine scholars and technicians and world-class opera singers, it ranks low worldwide when it comes to average pupils reading and math levels. Today, we will focus on the history of modern schooling in Alamos and Sonora from the 18th century to the present. Okay, Errol. Okay, thank you very much, Pam. And uh, I, I've got Mark where I'm gonna stand and Lorna will stand there. I, I wanna introduce Lorna. Uh, first, she's going to be talking about uh, the schools here in Alamos and especially the founding of Kobosh uh, in the 1980s. And so first I'm gonna talk for a couple of minutes and, and then Lorna will, will take over. And I would look around to see what was there and there was, in so many of them, there was a school. This is the entire student body uh, in the town of Ellens uh, in Babia. Uh, no, back up one. The, there was the entire student body it's going slow. Okay. Yeah, in the town of Babia Cora. And then uh, in the town of El Ensenal, I took a picture of uh, this girl who was doing a math lesson. Uh, that the, the, these are in the Ye Cora area, if you want to go there. And then uh, this was a, in, in Arispe, Sonora. And I that became a picture that I used in an exhibit. Uh, the towns of Mexico that was in Japan. And so I kept anyway going to uh, the schools at Cerispe and going into classrooms, talking to teachers and students. This is kind of interesting. If you read, uh, the teacher is doing remedial work and she's got there, if you read it, uh, Pepe cleans his duck or, uh, you know, that's like, what? You know, you want to ask, and then it says, um, that duck uh, steps on that toad. And I have no idea what she's trying to teach, if it was grammar or something, but that was in Sinoquipe, uh, which is right by uh, Rispe. This was a kindergarten in Rispe. And by the way, I'll be showing or having exhibit of pictures in Rispe uh, coming up sometime this spring. This was an old Kino. If you've been to Kino Bay, there's uh, the Lasso Cardinal School in uh, Kino Viejo, and uh, a project I was a part of. We sanded and stained the desks that those students are are using, and so I went to photograph it afterward. Now we're back to Alamos uh, in Bartolome School, and this these pictures were in. 1999 and 2000. Uh, this particular picture is in our wonderful guidebook. And uh, we're, you know, these, these uh, boys who are now, you know, residents here of, of, of gentlemen of, of Alamos. Um, then, okay, another Bartolome school, go on. And, I don't have uh, this audio. Another Bartolome. Can you and, see if you can yeah. get the audio? Okay, just a second. Can you move it on, Carol? Yeah. Okay. Now, I've, I've got a couple of pictures, uh, actually four of the kindergartens that we have in Alamos right now. I don't have information on it. Lauren is going to talk about all the other schools. But the four kindergartens that I have, uh, go to the, the first. First of all, this, these pictures were, uh, they used to have and maybe still have a health day where the little kids from the kindergartens, Mark, they still do, it's in October, 
And so they dress as doctors and nurses. And this has been a number of years ago that I took these pictures. But what a great activity uh, to look for for any anyway way for next year, for October. Okay, go on to the, the next. And Thanks. okay. And then, uh, well, I've got El Barranco, the school there, the kindergarten there. Uh, these schools are closed right now for the pandemic. So I stuck my camera between the bars uh, just to try to get a picture. Uh, the second school uh, was on up north. El Barranco is up the 16th of September. Oh, this is La Campana. Uh, this is uh, Ellen's neighborhood, <laughs> uh, the school that is there. I just stuck my camera through the through the bars there. It's all closed. And this is Norbert, which is up north. Uh, I didn't know where this was, but I ran into Dewey and Debbie uh, out at the house that, that they are uh, staying in. And Dewey knew where the school was. You turn right, you turn left, whatever, but I got to it. I didn't get to the Takabaya school. Go to the next, uh, the fourth. Uh, school that I got was the one. Oh, and I didn't get the name. It was Fernando Montes de Oca. Okay, now we got it. <laughs> Montes de Oca. And that school is by the baseball stadium. I just put baseball stadium there. And anyway, the fifth kindergarten that we have here in town is right here in this neighborhood in Takabaya. Well, at this time, I'm going to let Lorna take over. She's got several things to say, Lorna Acosta, and if you don't know, she knows everything about education uh, in this town. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, I want everybody, first of all, I want everybody to know that normally I do wear a mask, but I found that at the moment wearing a mask means you can't hear me and you can't understand me. So I will go maskless, me and Zorro. The first, the first slide we have is the front of Bartolomé M. Salido. And they have a, an enrollment of approximately 600 students. Now, what Mexico does is they have two sessions. So they've got a morning session and an afternoon session. And usually the morning session runs from about, oh, 7.30 or 8 until about 12.30, and the afternoon from about 1 until 5.30. Um, some kids prefer one, some kids prefer the other, and if you get stuck in the one you don't like, then your parents have to deal with where you were stuck. The building for Mar uh, Bartolome was a gift from the Salido family, and the stipulation was that the building must be used for education in continuity. So at the moment, I'm sure you all know where it is, it's just off the plaza. At the moment, it's being restored and renovated, so classes are being held in what was originally built to be a boarding school for students outside of the Alamos area. So that's, for people who are used to getting over there, it's kind of a walk. <laughs> the next school that we have is the one in the Barrio La Capilla. And if anybody's uh, been driven up Hidalgo, you've seen it right there on the right-hand side. Now this really is two schools in one building. It's the Lazaro Cárdenas and it's the Revolución. Now I don't know which one's morning and which one's afternoon, but that's the way they break it up. Again, we're looking at about 600 students in, this, in these two sessions. The third primary school that we have is Colegio Bilingüe San Felipe Neri. It is the only private elementary school in Alamos. Now it was founded in, and incorporated into the Secretary of Education and Cultura, SEC, in 2014. They started out, they had a kind of a rough start. They lost their, they lost their incorporation with the SEC and in 2017 but they continued teaching school until 2020. In 2020, the original director suggested, contacted the Secretary of Education and said, we would like to have this school reinstated. So they get, then again received their uh, incorporation 
and their registration with the Secretary of Education up until now in the present. This school is located across the street from the airport. Now, if you're driving kind of the way I do out to Palomares, you miss it. It's right there exactly opposite from the entrance to the airport. Now we'll go on to secondary schools. Now secondary, isn't she an angel? Yeah. She's, just, she's just a sweetheart. And they do all kinds of wonderful activities in, in San Felipe. Now we'll go on to the secondary schools. The first one that we'll talk about is Paulita Berkan. And Paulita Berkan has an enrollment of 285 students. Secondary schools in Mexico are seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, the equivalent of seventh, eighth, and ninth grade in the United States. So when somebody says they're in the tercero, the third year secundaria, for the way we do education in the States, they're really freshmen in high school. And that's why high school in this country is only three. So that's the Paulista Berjan. It's located right next door here to the Hacienda de los Santos. It is named for Paulita Berkan, who was an early educator here in Alamos, a phenomenal woman. Our next secondary school is the Escuela Federal Adrián Salas. And Adrián Salas has an enrollment of just over 300 students. It is named for an Alamense educator, Adrián Salas, who was worked here in the early 80s, late, uh, late 70s, and um, was very well known and very well accepted. Errol and I had a conversation this morning. He said, where is it? They can never find it. Well, if you go in the morning, it's pretty easy. You just follow all the kids in uniform. <laughs> but if you're looking for it, you'll go to the baseball stadium. You turn, instead of going up over the bridge, turn and head straight um, with your left shoulder looking at the baseball stadium. Go down that street about five or six blocks. There's a great big tree. You turn left and it's one block in there. Don't ask me the name of the street. I've lived in Alamos too long. I don't know the names of any of the streets. <laughs> so then we go on to the high school. The high school here in Alamos is called you want to go oh, okay. Let's university. do the university first. Let's do the university first. The university here in Alamos is called ITESCA. ITESCA stands for Instituto Tecnológico del Estado de Sonora de Cajeme. Now, if you've lived here long enough, you know that Cajeme was the original name of Ciudad Obregón. So a lot of the schools, a lot of the places carry that name of Cajeme through. The program is a nine semester program. It's eight semesters of instruction and one semester of a residency. And some of these kids go to Europe for their residencies. They're, they're very well versed. There are two degrees that are given at the ITESCA is a licenciado in turismo, which is pretty much the equivalent of what we call a degree in hospitality in the States. And the second degree is a licenciado in ingeniería mecánico, mechanical engineering. Now, a little bit of a little bit of a scoop on how Itesca got here. For many many years, anybody here in Alamos who wanted to go to higher education had to leave Alamos, and that meant that there were a lot of kids that were quite capable and able to continue their education but did not have the finances in order to do this. So it was discussed with ITESCA in Ciudad Obregón to see if they would be interested in opening a satellite campus here in Alamos. They said, yes, they would be if we could get the students. So the mine who was very, very interested in having mechanical engineers work for them said they would give um, 15 scholarships for kids, provided they studied mechanical engineering. Well, that worked for about a year. The next year, ITESCA found that they didn't have enough students to justify the presence of the university here. So they came, the, the board there for ITESCA came to Amigos de Educación. 
And they said, we need more students, but they can't pay the tuition. Can you help us? Amigos de Educación started with 13 scholarships at ITESCA. We now have 35 scholarships at ITESCA. And ITESCA has a current enrollment of approximately 150 students. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the girls that was, I'll brag a little bit, one of our scholarship recipients decided to major in tourism. She did her internship, her residency in Paris, came back here to Alamos and is now the teacher of French at the Ibesca campus. So that's kind of our goal is to make sure that we support students that want to go further their education, but then bring their knowledge back here to Alamos. So that pretty much covers the Desca. So now we'll go to the Kovach. And the Kovach has a current enrollment of about 150 students. It is 400. Four, excuse me, 450 students. As I said, it is grades 10, 11, and 12. There are three years of prepa in Mexico. It is located, as I'm sure everybody knows, across the street from the baseball stadium. Now, the question arises, how did Kobash get here to Alamos? Well, during the presidency of Jesus Gil, which we all call Chuy, who was president from 1976 to 1979, several professionals here in Alamos determined that Alamos was experiencing a severe brain drain. And kids that were capable and wanted to go on to high school were having to leave town um, so some of these professionals, of which there are a few names that you may recognize, Baldomero Corral, now not the one that has the tortilla factory, but his father, who was president of Alamos prior to Chuiji. Uh, Dr. Romero Pompa, who at one point was instrumental in getting the hospital here in Alamos. Profesora Hortensia Garcia Graqueda, who was um, quite an educator here for many, many years here in Alamos, and Rene Castaneda, who was the director of Save the Children when Save the Children opened its offices here in Alamos. So they worked together, and in 1978, these four men formed a committee and asked several of the other professionals in town to join them to work on establishing this high school. Some of, the, some of the professionals that were contacted are some people that I know relatively well. Antonio Acosta, uh, I see him pretty much on a daily basis. Jose Luis Oliva, the dentist, the accountant Rogelio Salido, as well as Beto Franco and Father Felipe Valenzuela, amongst various others. When this committee got together, they formed Escuela Preparatoria de Alamos. And that when the American community caused a bit of a chuckle because it was about the same time that the EPA was formed in the United States. This was, um, this was supported by a small, unreliable stipend from the state of Sonora. Some months it would come and some months it wouldn't come. In the meantime, they still had to pay rent for the building next door to the Palacio, which I believe is the building where Alicia Alcorn now lives. Um, they had the small stipend from the state. The Palacio also gave them a stipend. But more than anything, this committee became a fundraising committee as well. They also became, for the most part, unpaid teachers. Um, Father Felipe, for example, taught philosophy. Antonio Acosta with his medical degree taught biology. Uh, there was a chemist here in town who taught uh, mathematics. And all of these people did it for free, but they were there every day for their classes. Later on, there was property purchased for the building of the school. And again, the committee got busy and got together the money for the building of the school. 
The property was located where the Comandancia is currently located on the road out to San Bernardo. When Beto Branco became president in 1982, he approached this gentleman named Antonio Acosta and said, would you be willing to head the committee? And Antonio said, yes, I believe that this is something that our community desperately needs. So Antonio headed the committee from 1982 to 1985. Um, among various other things that he was doing, like raising a family, running a medical <laughs> practice. Uh, my personal opinion is that the reason the state did not give a very consistent nor large donation was because they weren't really sure that this little committee was gonna work, that people were going to be able to have enough initiative to get a high school going. So in the interim, we had four directors or principals from 1978 through 1985. It started with Renee Castaneda. The next one was a woman from Navajoa named Enida Huiltre. The next, the next director was a director that only lasted for one semester and I apologize, I cannot remember his name. After that, it was Professora Hortensia de Garcia, and she was the director until 1985 when the state came in and said, we would like to found a school here in Alamos and thus became the Kovash here in Alamos. The, during this also, one of the main organizations that was very essential and helpful in raising funds was the brand new club of the Lions Club here in Alamos. And that again, worked for several years here in Alamos. Unfortunately, it is now defunct. So that kind of covers education up to the current day. Um, I think primary education in this country is phenomenal in the metropolitan. And I'm considering Alamos as a metropolitan area as opposed to going to some of the ranches. So now I'll let Errol talk about some of the history of some of the spaces. Well, first, let's give a hand for Lorna. And there might be a question for Lorna because Lorna has to step out. So Kovash is Colegio de Bachilleres en el Estado de Sonora. And they have them, uh, the Kovash. Uh, campuses are all over. They're the all state. over the state, and they're often numbered. Huh? Uh, numbered. Oh, this Somebody history class. They're, they can't see you. Yeah. Who had a question? Any other questions? We need to get. I'm uh, all of you that are watching by Zoom. Please mute uh, because okay. we're, we're hearing you. Okay. You might you might recognize one or two names from that first graduating class from Alamos, from the EPA, from the Escuela Preparatoria de Alamos. Here's a name that I'll throw out that you probably recognize. Antonio Estrada Cantu, the director of our museum. Um, Francisco Gil, Blanca Gámez Ramírez, um, Jose Luis Arredondo, Sasueta, Emilio Lara Sanchez. Those are all students that were in that first graduating class. So, and I do have a list and I'm going to give it to Errol. So hopefully we can post this list on the History Club page with the list of the original teachers of which Adrian Salas was one. And hopefully we can uh, all get a chance to look at and know some of these students that were part of this original graduating class from the Escuela Preparatoria de Alamos. Thank you. Thank you again, Lorna, for what you had. Okay, uh, back to the, uh, the PowerPoint. I do want to mention, I saw Tony Estrada this morning and I told him, and he was aware because uh, he and Lorna had been in contact and I was hoping that we could get Tony here, but he is meeting with uh, the Cultural Institute on the upcoming festival and he couldn't come, but he was excited uh, that we were talking about Kobosh and about education and all of this. 
and we will get this posted. So thanks again, Lauren. My so, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is go into the historical aspects uh, of the education, and I'll be kind of brief because uh, this is a topic that if you're a former teacher or involved, you might be more interested than uh, if you're just a, a person who loves Alamos and is in this community. But uh, we have, I listed there, this was from the source by uh, Mary Kay Bond at the University of Illinois. And uh, she did a, a, a documentation, a thesis on uh, the uh, 19th century uh, education in Mexico. But she mentioned that the Jesuits uh, first started uh, education here in Sonora in uh, 1524. And of course, we know Cortez came in 1519, and he pretty much took control of the country in 1521. So it was a very short time until uh, the Jesuits arrived. And one of the things they did was try to educate the public, and they did so uh, with schools. And also, um, the, in the 18th century, now we're talking in the 1700s, over Europe, uh, it was very important, the, especially the, uh, the Bourbon kings of Spain felt that to have a modern society, you had to educate them, and they, they tried as hard as possible in all of the territories that were under Spain to see that education programs were developed. And that's one thing I put there then uh, back in the 19th century, when we had Mexico divided between the liberals and the conservatives, we had Maximilian here in 1860. Despite all of this, everyone on both sides agreed to the importance of education. But if you look, when the revolution began in 1910, two thirds of the population was basically illiterate. So despite all of the efforts, and a lot of that Ill illiteracy came uh, you know, in the, uh, the rural areas and the indigenous areas of Mexico. And, uh, okay. Now, we have one of the things that I have here, if you look at five and, and six, you know that the early education had a religious component because, of course, the Jesuits were a part. And, uh, and when the uh, Jesuits were expelled from Spain, and that's a topic that I know we've talked about in the history club, and the Franciscans came, um, you know, they, uh, the crown sought to increase anyway the, the training uh, and put people in more of a vocational, to use education to train the population of the indigenous people towards what we say useful careers. They also wanted to put education under the towns so that the towns would feel an involvement. And this continued for the last 200 years. Uh, in some countries in Europe, education is top down. If you're in France uh, and you're studying whatever chemistry, if you're on page 141 uh, in Paris, you're on page 141 in Lyon, whatever you're on the same page. In Mexico, uh, the, you know, the emphasis was to get a buy-in from the community uh, on the, the, the schools. Now, the powers of education were largely delegated to the clergy. And there was not, uh, it, it kind of developed after the revolution, especially uh, to where the schools became secularized. And while there were the three R's of the reading, writing, arithmetic, you also had philosophy and a religious catechism uh, as part of the schools. Um, now, the, I have there, after independence, uh, the role of the church remained uh, you know, in education, but a political uh, catechism was added then. So you had the religious catechism, now you had a political catechism, due to independence and creating a society that appreciated uh, the independence uh, that they had achieved. And uh, also we have there that 
uh, the state of Jalisco took a leadership role. And of course, Jalisco, you know, is for Guadalajara, you know, but, but they took a leadership role in education uh, in 1826. This is a few years after independence from Spain. And uh, they instructed or developed what we call the Lancaster method. Now, uh, my mother <laughs> taught in a one room school in Kansas in the 1930s. And they essentially use the Lancaster method because what you do is teach the ablest students and have those students then help those uh, that have more trouble learning. And it's kind of by committee in, in terms <laughs> Uh, you know, it's kind of a trickle down education. And so they, they developed that and it was used in the rural schools and continues to be used today uh, to where you don't have the resources for uh, the teachers. You get the teachers to teach students and then those students uh, help each other in learning. Now under Santa Ana, and of course he's considered a villain uh, in the history of Mexico, for a lot of good reasons. But under uh, Santa Ana, uh, they developed anyway licensing, the licensing of teachers uh, and the inspection of schools. And so that in these rural areas, especially, or in the large cities, uh, there were standards uh, anyway that were being set up. And, um, and I have a number 13, uh, the curriculum, curriculum remained constant uh, even after the Constitution of 1857, which separated uh, church from the state. So the religious, uh, the religious elements of education stayed there. Okay. Um, now, under the uh, Porfiriato, and this was the period that we all know about uh, Diaz, uh, Porfirio Diaz, and he was the president from 186, 1876 until he was forced out of office in 1910. And uh, he has been criticized a great deal because of his dictator uh, type control of the country. But among the good things that came during the Por Porfiriato was an emphasis on education. And he made that emphasis because he looked at Mexico and he wanted Mexico to be more like the United States in getting immigrants to come in, develop industry, and he saw the need. Here is all the manpower in the, the barrios and the uh, rural areas. We've got to educate them so that they can then uh, uh, help us to uh, improve the economy of Mexico. So we have that enrollments in primary schools tripled, and uh, if you took the primary and the uh, private schools together, we had still less than a million kids in school, uh, but that was, it represented 31% of the student population. And that of course was an increase during the Porfiriato. Uh, and also the teachers expanded uh, during the, the time that he was in office. And I thought it was interesting that the male literacy rate uh, for those over 12 was 33%. But the female literacy rate was only 13% at that time. So Mexico lagged behind, like many other countries, in the education, providing equal education for uh, the girls in the school. And then I have that on the eve of the revolution, most Mexicans were illiterate. And we'll go on to the next that we have. Now, I, I've added another source. That was all from. Uh, Barbara Vaughn with the University of Illinois. Wikipedia had some interesting things about uh, the education from the revolution, starting with 1917 uh, and uh, going through. And one of the things that our own, uh, you know, Alvaro Obregón, who is tied in here to Alamos, and of course now the, uh, the city of Tajeme uh, used to be, is now Obregón, uh, but he had a public education minister who was quite influential in expanding uh, education across the state. And it was secular. At this time in the 1920s, we had the Christian War and that affected almost, it affected everything, uh, you know, in Sonora. And, uh, but we, during that time, they separated 
uh, it became very, the education became secular. And of course, uh, the churches were, uh, the priests weren't allowed to uh, hold services. And Father Carpenter has talked about this at our history association before and been given us a lot of information. Uh, but they expanded, during this time, they expanded the public education. And uh, then under uh, President uh, Cardenas, between 1930 and 1936. Uh, then we had a socialistic element to education. Cardenas was definitely to the left uh, when during his presidency. And that's when the first uh, ejidos uh, came in to where you had community property. Some of the ranches were, uh, the large property estates were divided up and uh, given to uh, other groups. But also education then uh, switched it. It then had a, a socialistic uh, element to it. And this was all repealed then in the 1940s uh, when of course ed the education swung back. Okay, I'm standing in the wrong place. How am I there? Okay, visible? I can't see her. Oh, I know you are. I hope, am I visible out there in, uh, in Zoom land? Okay. Uh, and right now we have education is regulated by the uh, Secretary of Public Education and uh, by SEP and uh, they all standards have been presented and religious education is prohibited within the school, but of course religious associations are free to uh, provide their own schools and set them up, including the elementary school that we have here at Malmo. Um, this is, is Jose Luis, and I don't know if he was the one that was in that first graduating class or not, but this, he was uh, a teacher. I took these pictures out of me in his, uh, el his elementary school classroom. Uh, this is just window dressing okay, uh, on the lesson. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the things I want to talk about was rural education because that's where there were, that's where the great need was. Uh, the kids in the larger cities of Mexico could go to schools uh, freely, but uh, kids like in these, uh, in our uh, municipio, these little towns out there really had nothing. And so for rural education, uh, again, the, uh, there was a, in 1926, a core was established uh, of, uh, you know, uh, a group of inspectors and 3,000 teachers uh, were, were added. And each teacher was given a zone and the idea was to spread the education and it became more vocational in nature as it had been before. But uh, in these schools, sometimes they didn't have buildings, they had a shade tree or a roof and the kids learned the three R's but they also, uh, they might've had uh, pigs and chickens there uh, for the kids to, uh, you know, to learn from. Uh, they might teach uh, weaving, we have here, uh, soap making, I can't imagine, but uh, soap making, if that was needed in the area, it was uh, taught in the school. Also, they mentioned tanning. And of course, here in Olomos, we had a huge tanning industry, leather industry, uh, you know, a number of years ago. And it, I, I have here, and this is from, uh, the rural uh, primary education by Schoenhall. But uh, the, again, and I've touched on it before, the idea was for the local village to take as much responsibility as possible, even in uh, the uh, generating funds, like Lorna talked about Kolach. Uh, they were fundraising to get that school started. And there's a great, has been a great emphasis in the rural schools to get the community to provide whatever funding they can, because then they will have that involvement with the school. Um, it says, but the will to improvise and the acceptance of teachers uh, who had an education barely superior to that of villagers brought success to a movement which might otherwise have existed only on paper. So it was a, a grassroots uh, movement, uh, which has, and I think if you look at education, you look in the indigenous communities, the Maya communities, the Yaqui communities, education was something entirely different. And, the, and many of them saw no purpose for it. 
uh, because it was different from their traditions and their culture. And so they had to get the community back uh, to make it, make it work. Okay, next slide. Now we're gonna go to Alamos. Oh man, I'm okay, I got a little time. I'm, I'm trying to hurry up. Uh, this is the Almadas of Alamos book. And uh, many of you have read this book. We're gonna talk about the Almadas in a meeting that we have in late February. And uh, I know you're gonna to want to hear about that. If you're new to Alamos, I said we one of you from the night. Please, please mute your microphones, everyone. And uh, first of all, we know about the famous, uh, you know, uh, Bishop Antonio de los Reyes. He came born in Spain in 1757. He came here uh, uh, to uh, Alamos, and he was going to be the bishop in Arispe, which was the center at that time and, and the first capital of Sonora in Arispe. It's a little village now on the Sonora River. But he went to Arispe and he looked around and he said, there's not much happening here. And I want to go back to Alamos. They've got <laughs> beautiful buildings and whatever else. And so he came and uh, at, at that time, he was instrumental in getting the church started. And he also started the very first school in Alamos in the uh, late 18th century. Now, his uh, nephew was Father uh, Jose Antonio Juan Almada, and he was really an educator that had quite an influence here in town, because uh, first he was the pastor of the church, and uh, during that time, he preached fire and brimstone sermons about how the rich should help the poor. And of course, the members of the church were primarily the rich, and after a while, they got kind of tired hearing about how they should go out and help the poor. And eventually, uh, he said, I don't want to be the priest anymore. I want to work in the school. And he went to the school that the bishop uh, raised and founded. And uh, he, he uh, was a fundraiser. And uh, he was anyway relieved of his parochial duties. And he had no trouble raising money for his school. Uh, he taught philosophy, but he, in his school, he made it uh, mandatory that a majority of the students were from poor families. And his belief was that for the future of Mexico, for the future of the church, we had to get priests from the, the, the indigenous communities, from the poor people, it shouldn't be that the priests come uh, from the educated uh, uh, elite in Mexico City. So that was uh, his goal. Next slide. Um, now, it had that Father uh, Jose was uh, kind of shy and awkward with people, but he was an excellent teacher. Uh, very strict in the classroom, had his bamboo cane, but at recess, he would uh, uh, play games with the kids and uh, he was an excellent teacher. Uh, in 1810, he left because he felt that Alamos was too worldly, was changing, and he went to a small village in Sinaloa, and he came back uh, uh, to Alamos, and he died anyway in 1817. But he is one of the early educators uh, that we owe a great debt uh, to here in Alamos. Um, now, also in the book uh, from the Almadas and Alamos, uh, we have that the first high school in Alamos, we heard about Kovac today, uh, was started by an Ecuadorian. And uh, Jacinto Camaño was uh, working in San Francisco, and he ran into Gregorio Almada, who was there on business or whatever. And somehow in that friendship, in that friendship, uh, into Asito uh, uh, coming here to uh, Alamos and starting a school. Now, Gregorio himself also started a school, and he had the the sale, um, you know, which was uh, he had it was both boarding and daytime school. It was in his mansion. Uh, there and kids, uh, we have there, we pay $25 a month 
which included board and room and uh, tuition. And the day the day pupils was eight were eight dollars a month. And uh, but both schools operated, uh, and they were taught by the directors. And Gregorio taught, and uh, you know Jacinto taught. And uh, Gregorio taught not only uh, the English and uh, the philosophy, but also music, vocal and instrumental, which of course has been very important in almost since that time. And, huh? I'm, I didn't understand. Ah, oh, okay. I can't, I can't answer that. Uh, but since he was in Almada, it could have been in the Almada house. I didn't look at it. I'll get back to you, Ellen. That's what, that's what presenters say. I'll get back to you with more information. Now, before these schools were founded, uh, as we've mentioned before, uh, kids to get their education went to Guadalajara or Mexico City, or in some cases abroad to Europe. Okay. Next slide. Pardon the interruption here. Yeah. I'll get Umberto to help me. Okay, uh, let's back it up one. I think we, we have another. Okay, no, we have it there. No, okay, let's go to the next then. Okay, uh, that was anyway from the Almadas and Almos and uh, by Stag. And that is a great book uh, for, for you to read. We have a copy in our research library, but we can't really check it out. Um, and, you know, in some cases, there might be a used copy on, uh, you know, on, on, well, Amazon, something like that. Anyway, it's a great read. Now, we talked on December 16th about Otilia uh, Ure de Figueroa, and she mentioned. Uh, when she came back to Almos in 1990 as a, a, an elderly lady of 87, uh, she stayed in the uh, Tesoros and she was in stayed in the same room where she had gone to school uh, when she was in the first grade. So yeah, there was a school in the Tesoros at that time which was before uh, her uncle bought that property. Uh, one thing that we've talked about before that Tesoros was uh, widely thought to have, uh, to have been a convent, but uh, according to our, uh, our his, uh, town historian, there's absolutely no evidence that it ever was. But anyway, she said, I thought this was kind of funny. And this is in an article that Bev Kruchek wrote and she said, uh, this is the room where I attended the first grade in public school before Joaquin bought it. Uh, my teacher was Concepcion, uh, uh, or probably Bocortes, and she, that was 87 years ago. Now I don't remember what happened three days ago. That sounds familiar uh, to uh, some of us here. Okay, next. She had, when I talked about her, uh, this was a map of all of and uh, you see that there is a school mentioned right next to the Palacio. And Lorna mentioned that today, uh, but it's to the opposite side of the Palacio than Alicia's house. So at one time uh, on her map of Alamos, which she drew up from her childhood in about 1900, uh, there was a school right there in the building next to the Palacio. There was also a school uh, down um, uh, over Home Street, and uh, she mentions uh, something about that school, but I'm not sure exactly where it was. Uh, that's not a very good uh, picture, but this is the map that is on the back of Otilia uh, Orea de Figueroa. Okay, next slide. Now, she mentions about her first school and, uh, you know, that she went to, and that uh, Melita Marieta was her first teacher. And um, she mentions about a great teacher that she uh, stayed in touch with uh, for much of her life, 
and uh, her name was Rafina Delgado, and um, her her parents. Uh, I think she was the one that they asked her to come and teach her during during the summer to teach uh, Ophelia and her, her sisters. And um, she had a great gift for uh, being very enthusiastic about education. And Ophelia uh, kept in touch with her. And in fact, she said that even though she went to Mexico City, a number of her former students uh, were there when she died at an advanced age. Um, in the next slide, um, we have, um, she says, I have always been interested and intrigued by a school that existed much before my time on Calle de uh, Aurora. And that, of course, is Madero Street down there. That used to be called uh, Aurora. And she says, a couple from Switzerland started a school there and uh, ran it for some time. She didn't have any information. Now, this is during the late 1800s about it, but she felt that probably the wealthy families of all amongst had dropped them. And um, she said also there was uh, the boarding school uh, run by three sisters, uh, unmarried uh, uh, sisters from uh, Tehiti in uh, Nangari. And they, uh, she says it was, uh, when it was closed, the three sisters then became caterers and uh, became well known across the town for uh, various public events. And um, there was also a, a school for boys uh, that came about in the late uh, 1800s. And also, we all know that the Boers Community Center was a school, and it opened. And uh, when I talked to Lorna yesterday, but I didn't get my notes, uh, but when it, uh, the school at Boers, it opened uh, in at least 1930. And it closed in about 1978, uh, 1979. And uh, Lorna's, uh, well, Antonio's mother went to that school uh, there at the, at the Boers. And it was run by religious order. And I think it was only for girls at that time. Now, I, I should have gotten more. I, I talked to Lorna. I got some information down, but then I forgot to put it in my notes. Uh, but I know that uh, there was family here I ran into that they had sent their daughter in the 1970s to that school. And the girl had been kind of a problem uh, in her school in the U.S. Uh, and the family, uh, you know, bought a home and almost. They put her in the school because the nuns kept her under control. Probably we had the rulers on the knuckles or whatever anyway in that school. Um, Anyway, another boys' school she mentions, and uh, in there, and this was uh, Ophelia Figueroa. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, we talked about our Bartolome. I have just a couple of photos, and of course, that school is being remodeled right now, and right down there in the street. Um, Juan Carlos Ogi uh, Balderrama, our town historian, chronicle Cronisa. Um, a few years ago, he had uh, on the anniversary of the 100th year of Bartolome, he uh, posted uh, information from the inauguration in 1910. It's interesting that uh, in 1910, it was the centennial celebration of Mexico. And of course, we all remember the bicentennial celebration uh, just uh, 11 years ago. But in the centennial celebration, uh, President Diaz wanted uh, to emphasize education. He wanted new schools started, and Bartolome was one of those schools. And as Lauren said, the land was uh, donated by the Salido family, and it had to be used for education. And that became an issue because people wanted to buy that school when it, you know, when it was a question of being remodeled, wanted to open a hotel. And that became an issue that it was given to the city uh, to be a school. And uh, so anyway, Juan Carlos writes about it. And um, he mentions there were 1,419 words 
uh, inaugurated throughout the Republic in 1910, which ended up being uh, Diaz's final uh, year in office. And a fourth of them were new schools. And they had the, uh, the school was, um, let's see, what was it? It was first going to be the Barbara Ceballos a School for Girls, and that was for uh, the wife of Bartolome Salino. And that name didn't sit. Here is the, uh, the list of activities that they had for the opening of the school, overture by the orchestra. I imagine we had a town orchestra that probably performed in the kiosk. Our kiosk was, was built in 1904. And um, there, the, the, uh, the Presidente at that time should have his name, I know, but the Presidente uh, read from the deed and thanked uh, the Salino family for donating the building. And um, they solemnly declared the name, there was a national anthem, and it had that. The names chosen were San Bartolome and uh, the Santa Barbara, Barbara for the girls. And uh, it later became Bartolome and Salido, uh, partly to when the separation uh, of, of the church and the schools came about. Next uh, slide. And anyway, five days after the event, this is just more that he had kind of interesting reading. And this appeared on his Facebook page, which uh, is uh, almost through the ages of Traves de los Siglos, which uh, is a must for those of us here. In and uh, anyway, that's it. Go on to the next. I'm reading this with just a few pictures that I have. Uh, this was a graduation from the Kobach, and the girl there is Sam and Carol Moratz's granddaughter, Alexa uh, uh, Rodriguez, who graduated from the Kobach in 2013. And because she was graduating, I went there and took some pictures. Uh, be before the ceremony, they had a party, and a student band played, and that's, um, we got several pictures of the old people real quick. I've been running out time and waiting for it okay takes a second to get them up uh this was the honor guard anyway for the uh, posting of colors uh before the ceremony and the next picture is of the, the guard as they are walking through and uh, we got the, the uniforms of the graduates and afterward they had a big dance out at andrew mcgahee's uh resort out there on the edge of town now, then I also have some pictures of Valentine's Day at uh, the Revolution School. There's Trini uh, in the center and Mike Foster over to the right. I don't know everybody within the I Yeah, I think so. Yes, and that's what he was there for. He had a garden and helped the kids with it. But since it was Valentine's Day, uh, they had uh, English words. Uh, Trini had their words for uh, love and hug and you know, all of those things, and the kids were uh, having a lot of fun on that day. And a lot of people from almost went to the school that day, and I think they do every year. Trini organizes it, and there are more kids from uh, Revolucion uh, School. And uh, we get the next. Hey, there is Emily. Uh, who's watching, I think, right now uh, with a, a student there at the school and uh, in a classroom uh, shot. And then our final picture uh, is another shot of the classroom there in uh, 2016 uh, for the day. Well, that concludes, and I went longer than I wanted, but that concludes education. I don't know if you have any questions uh, either from our Zoom audience or from our people here. I don't know that I could answer anything. If I had Lorna, the two of us, uh, thanks to her, could answer. But anyway, if no questions, any questions from abroad coming in? Not, not a question, but a comment. I'm reading a recently written book about the Aztecs now. And in this book, the author points out that before the Spanish conquest in the Aztec 
empire, certainly in uh, the main capital city of the empire, there were schools. Girls were taught how to be proper mothers and wives. The boys were taught how to be great warriors. And there was a special school for those who would become the religious um, officiants in the empire. So there were schools before the Spanish, but how broadly through they were the Aztec empire, I don't know. Well, Pam, I'm looking forward to uh, your presentation, which we're going to schedule. Uh, Pam is going to talk about this book uh, in an upcoming uh, presentation. And so I'm anxious to hear more. Uh, you never think about the Aztecs in education. You think about them as uh, warriors. But, uh, I'll, I'll be, we'll all be happy to learn more. Okay, are there any other comments from... Uh, our Zoom audience or question. Well, if not, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for being here. Our, oh, and I've got to give some announcements. Saturday, we're having uh, a tour and uh, you can reserve the, uh, the bus. Those of you who aren't here today can reserve by email. Uh, we will meet at 10.30 on Saturday at the main church. Father Carpenter will direct the tour. Uh, the cost of the bus is 200 uh, pesos. You can pay then, or you can give Carolyn money now and reserve the spot. But uh, we only have 19 uh, spots, and I'm, I'm sure, I think that'll be sufficient. But a lot of people are excited about seeing the inside of the chapel of La Capilla. Okay, well, as some have, that have lived here for many years have never been inside, and you'll have that opportunity. And we'll go out to uh, La Juana, to Baldonera, and we're going to throw in lunch on the way back. And, um, you know, yeah, it'll be a no-host lunch of, uh, at a place that Stephanie and I are picking out. So anyway, that will be Saturday. And I hope we have a good turnout for that. Um, next Thursday, I will be giving information. Uh, the tour was to be next Thursday, but because of Father Carpenter's schedule, we had to move it uh, to Saturday. But I will be sending out information on all the events uh, that we have. And we're, oh, oh, one other thing, last word. January is the time to pay your dues uh, to become a member if you have not done it, you can pay here in person 200 pesos, or you can send a check to our treasurer, uh, Joan Powell in Green Valley. And I have her address in the email that I sent out yesterday. So uh, please send that to her and make the check to Joan because uh, we're still uh, don't have officially our account in the US for the History Association. I want to thank you all for being here. And, thank uh, you, Errol. Thank you. Stay now, for all of you, stay for lunch here at the Goodbye. Goodbye.